exclusions. How does carbon-14 dating work? Well, carbon-14 is made in the atmosphere by cosmic rays, not directly. Atoms are shattered, and they produce neutrons, and the neutrons hit mostly nitrogen-14. Um, it's especially easy reaction to do, and they pop out a proton on the other end and produce carbon-14. This protection right now is fairly constant. Um, Carbon-14 mixes with ordinary carbon, first in the atmosphere and then in the biosphere. I should probably explain the biosphere. The biosphere does include the atmosphere, but it also includes plants of various kinds, animals, um, uh, people, uh, birds, whatever, uh, the, the rivers that have some carbon dioxide dissolved in them, and the ocean, uh, in including the upper ocean animals as well. Anyway, carbon-14 is found throughout the biosphere. The concentration of carbon-14 in today's biosphere is approximately one part in a trillion, a little sh shade over of ordinary carbon. And carbon-14 gradually decays back to nitrogen-14. And so if you know what the concentration was to begin with and you know what the concentration is now, you have a dating method. It works like this. The ratio of carbon-14 to ordinary carbon in the atmosphere is assumed to always have been constant. Nowadays, we know better, but uh, they think maybe it's pretty close, and so they'll kind of stick with it. Plants get carbon from the atmosphere with this carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio, and animals eat plants with this ratio, or other animals with this ratio, and so carbon-14 stays mixed in but when an animal dies, or a plant dies, or a plant lays down wood, the carbon-14 is no longer replaced and starts to decay. It decays at an exponential rate, and if you measure the carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio of a dead plant or animal, you can do, do make a date out of it. Now, for the math phobic, close your eyes for 30 seconds, it will all go away. Um, there are formulas for finding the age by the uniformitarian model. Uh, carbon-14, is, it's an exponential expression, and uh, if you turn it around, you can find time by a logarithm, and uh, the constants are there, and they use a constant uh, half-life, which is about one, uh, or is about 3% too uh, short, but it's pretty close. Um, now, why did the paleo group's data have to be suppressed? Well, it's really simple. Residual carbon-14 is incompatible with millions of years. You can do this math at home, okay? In one million years, the entire Earth's weight in carbon-14 would be gone. That's just one million, not 65 or 70 or 80 or whatever. Basically, you take the entire mass of the Earth and you turn it into carbon-14. That's not just the carbon-14 in the Earth or the carbon-12 turned into carbon-14. It's the carbon, the oxygen, the nitrogen, the silicon, the uranium, the lead, everything turned into carbon-14. And uh, if you, that'll give you, uh, if you divide, uh, multiply by Avogadro's number and divide by 14 grams per mole of carbon-14, you will get uh, 2.5 times 10 to the 50th atoms, which gives you about um, 167.5 half-lives, okay? Now, if you take one million years and divide it by the correct carbon-14 age, which is a little longer, 5,730 years, you'll get 174.5 half-lives. And what that does is that gives you seven half-lives left over to decay that last atom of carbon-14. It has a greater than 99% chance of decaying. Now, in fact, it's worse than that. At 250,000 years, you are down to less than an atom per gram of carbon-14 if you start with today's uh, carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio. And considering that you're measuring maybe two milligrams and you're using about 2% of that in the machine, you should not have more than about uh, uh, one atom in 2,500 uh, runs. Basically, it should be zero. Now, residual uh, carbon-14 is compatible with any particular age you want to in terms of short chronology because what you're actually measuring is not an age. You're measuring the carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio. 
And according to standard flood theory, there should have been probably a little less carbon-14 in the past because of a stronger magnetic field, because of startup effects, whatever. And there should be much, much more ordinary carbon in the past. And remember, if you enlarge the denominator of a fraction, it makes the fraction smaller, so that one-eighth is smaller than one-half, okay? So that if you apply those correcting factors, you can get down to the youngest age I know of that anybody pr proposes, 4,300 years. It's not unreasonable. But remember that residual carbon-14 is incompatible, period, with long age. Now, there are other people who back up this idea. Uh, residual carbon-14 has been predicted by creationists since at least 1970. I found an article that said that. And there's apparent residual carbon-14 has been noted by creationists since 1988, at least. Um, I published some data suggesting that residual carbon-14 was there, uh, or uh, I noted published data. Somebody else did the research. And, um, called for experiments in 1997 um, in a book that I wrote. And Andrew Snelling, about the same time, whether there's a relationship or not, I don't know, um, but he did several dates on his own starting about the same time. And um, then in 2000, I called for testing creationist models in a specific article that, whose purpose was precisely that. And then I reviewed the literature on carbon-14 and very old material in 2001. And that's why I'm t giving you this talk in spite of the fact that I'm a physician and not a physicist. Um, the rate group, I encouraged them to do some sampling, and they did, and they did some coal samples and some diamonds. And those are reported in uh, Baumgartner's paper in 2005, which got into uh, radioisotopes in the age of the Earth. And that, again, is online. You can check it out. Um, the rate group, you will notice that they have Eocene, Cretaceous, and Pennsylvanian coal. And you'll notice that the highest is Pennsylvanian, and the second lowest is Pennsylvanian. And the second highest is Cretaceous, and the lowest is Cretaceous, and the Eocene is somewhere in between. Uh, it, has n it has no trend with geologic time. And you'll also notice that it's from various states. These are gotten from all over. Uh, the background, according to the lab, was 0.77. And these are all above background. But what the article will tell you is that these already have that background subtracted out. There are reasons to argue that the background is actually a little bit lower, about 0.57 or so. But in either case, it's well above background. Um, if I can get this thing to move. Um, the rate group also dated diamonds. Their first, group, first ones are, you know, the two standard deviation confidence limits for two or three, depending on which one of those levels you pick, uh, overlap with the background. And this time, the background was not subtracted out by the lab. And so uh, maybe there's some carbon-14 in that diamond, maybe not. Uh, but they did five more or six more uh, diamonds. And that group were all above background. Diamonds are supposed to be Precambrian. That's 1.5 billion or whatever years. They should have no carbon-14. Well, this irritated um, some um, uh, carbon-14 researchers who decided they were going to do their own experiments. And so they did. And you can find this again online if you want to. Um, their data is, as reported, is kind of all over. I don't know why they did that. But I put it back in chronological order. Um, and. If you look at it carefully, you'll notice that one date down there, that's 0.005%. That is the oldest date in the literature anywhere. And you know, it's so small, I could say, yeah, 
maybe that's contamination. Okay, and there are two dates right next to it that kind of, well, they statistically overlap, and so maybe all of that's contamination. Um, but then when they did their next diamond, they did six different faces of it because they, were, they couldn't believe their answers. And you can see that it's statistically higher than those other three samples. And you can't blame it on the machine having a bad day because, in fact, their graphite controls are actually slightly lower than the graphite controls for the first experiment. Now, they did another di uh, diamond, and that one is still up around the second one. And so they were never able to reproduce that first one. But the, the third round did have um, the graphite up a little higher, and so maybe the machine was having a bad day that day. Um, after that, Rada published an article on carbon-14 from radium. Uh, carbon-14 was measured in natural gas wells. I'm not giving you an absolutely complete uh, uh, Snelling did some more data as well. Uh, but the Mosasar data were published, and then the Paleo group presented its data. Um, now, where are we now? Well, carbon-14 is consistently measured in fossil carbon. Machine error can be eliminated. Most people don't believe that. Nuclear synthesis underground is orders of magnitude too small to account for the data. You do the calculations, it doesn't work. Um, underground contamination is unrealistic. Think about contaminating a whole coal seam evenly. Uh, that's uh, 10 miles across and 10 miles the other way, and uh, maybe a three feet thick. Uh, it's really hard to visualize how that works. Uh, laboratory contamination was the go-to e explanation, but it's becoming increasingly unrealistic. And in fact, the people who know the data best don't believe it. The first one I'll give you is Kirk Birchie. Um, and it, I can't tell you how I know that he knows, but he does. Um, while this conclusion explains the higher values for the biological samples in general, it does not account for all the details. Some biological samples do have radiocarbon levels not explainable by chem sample chemistry. He hastens to add, oh, these are probably biological carbonates both, uh, uh, and, and coal, which are both prone to in situ contamination. Um, which ones is he talking about? Well, specifically, he's talking about the Baumgartner coal samples, which do show significant radiocarbon above background inviting explanation. So his explanation is that somehow the coal got all contaminated. Now, it has to be contaminated in the last 6,000 years or something like that, because otherwise it decays too. You can't contaminate it over millions of years. And Harry Gove is summarized by Kathleen Hunt, and he, he says, uh, carbon-14 in coal is probably produced de novo by radioactive decay of uranium thorium on series as naturally found in rocks, and which is found in varying concentrations of different rocks, hence the variation in carbon-14 constant in different coals. There's no published data, by the way, about that. Um, this is just a hypothesis waiting for data. Research is ongoing at this very moment. Well, that was how long ago, and they still haven't published the research. So, Laboratory contamination is increasingly unrealistic, but compa a comparison of fossil carbon and some other standard should be attempted because it wasn't done the first time, and I think it should be done. But the most reasonable hypothesis is that there is residual carbon-14 in fossil carbon. Now, we've gone through the introduction, the brief explanation, and explanation of why the paleo group's dinosaur data had to be suppressed, uh, the data that support their findings, and finally, we're at the summary and conclusions. Don't expect this to get into the peer-reviewed literature. There are four classes of creationist research. Those that make creationism harder to maintain, you can publish them any time you want. Those that are neutral, yeah, you can publish them pretty easily. Those that solve problems for creationism but don't give problems for long age, yeah, you can probably publish them too. Uh, you have to be careful. But those that strike at the heart of atheism, those that show the need for an intelligent designer, or those that present a strong argument for short age, they won't get in unless somebody's asleep at the switch and doesn't stop it. 
Now, one doesn't have to be venal and cynical to oppose as such research being published. One only has to know that the opposition can't possibly be right, and besides that, you know, it'd be unfairly damaging and the opposition isn't honest and all that. Now, sometimes we do that too, and so you cut them a little slack on that, okay? Um, the paleo group has been told that they cannot get any more of their sample data by University of Georgia lab. I'm not gonna read you uh, because of time constraints, but it's up there for those of you who can pause the, the uh, machine and read it. And the same is true for a commercial lab which declined it uh, because they were afraid it would make their lab look bad. Um, I have found the same problem. The lab that cooperated with the rate group is toast now. They, can't, they couldn't get grants and their, their funding dry, dried up and now they're gone. And that means that we may have to make our own lab. Um, I'm working on that. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Geem. I know that in my experience, possibly the number one thing that I get asked about is carbon-14 dating. Uh, people find it quite troubling, and I think you might find it a little bit surprising that in fact carbon-14 is helpful to a short chronology, the kind of chronology that we as Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, believe is accurately recorded in God's Word. Our next speaker is Dr. Anthony Bosman. Uh, Dr. Bosman has his PhD in mathematics from Rice University, and he currently teaches in the mathematics department uh, here at Andrews University. Um, I've been told that none of us should panic that uh, his PhD is in applied mathematics and specifically something so incredibly complicated that I won't pretend to understand it. It has to do with knots and knot theory. I know this is really important stuff, <laughs> really important stuff, but he's actually going to talk about some other aspects of mathematics this afternoon. Please welcome him. Thank you. I want to begin by showing you the most beautiful equation. Here it is. Take a look at it. As you see it, I know what you're all thinking. Yeah, that's beautiful. Right? You're taking out your phones, you're taking pictures of it, because this is a beautiful equation. Well, maybe when you see it, you just see symbols. But mathematicians, when we see this, we see beauty. We often talk about beauty and elegance in mathematics. A team of researchers at the University of College London wanted to understand why do mathematicians talk about beauty all the time? So what they did is they got a group of mathematicians to come to their lab, and they had them sit in an fMRI machine so they could scan their brain while they showed them images of equations. And what they discovered is when they showed these mathematicians images of equations such as this, these beautiful equations, the mathematicians, in their brain, the emotional center would light up. The same regions of the brain that light up when you see a great painting, watch a sunset, listen to a beautiful piece of music. Their brains were lighting up. They were seeing beauty. I want to help you right now see that beauty as well. So let's unpack this equation. Inside of it, we have five numbers, one and zero. Those are familiar. And then some unfamiliar numbers denoted by the letters E and I and pi. Let's review these. One is very familiar. You count. I have a sheep, one sheep. And once you can count to one, if you have two sheep, you can go one, one, have two sheep, right? So it's a very natural number. It's the most natural thing. I have one of something. There's a small step of abstraction. I had a sheep. Now I have an abstract idea of one, but it's not that big of a step. How about zero? Well, it's a little bit more difficult of an idea. I have zero sheep. What do you mean you have zero sheep? Well, I have none. If you have no sheep, why are you counting them, right? 
but, but, but there's, some, there's something there. It took us a while to accept zero because it's a little bit less natural than one and two and three. But we can wrap our minds around zero. How about the next number in this equation? Pi. You probably remember in, in grade school learning about pi. The circumference of a circle divided by its diameter always gives you pi. Wait a second. For any circle, a big circle, a small circle, yes, any circle, it's always pi. Well, what is pi? It's a little bit more than three. It's 3.14, maybe you learned. It's actually, it actually goes beyond that. It goes on forever. 3.14159265358979323846264338327950288. Forever, it keeps going. It's not a rational number. We consider it an irrational number. It's very different than like that one and that two and that three from counting sheep. It's a different kind of number. And yet still, it appears naturally in thinking about circles. So we can accept pi despite it being a little bit strange. Here's another irrational number. E. E, maybe you haven't seen this one, or maybe less familiar. It comes up in the calculus. It's really significant in the calculus when we think about rates of change and how the world is changing. E keeps showing up and, and modeling changing populations or finding areas under curves. The, the idea is a differentiation integration. E shows up all over the place. It's deeply connected to the idea of the infinite. Although it's not infinity, it's just a number a little bit smaller than three. 2.718281828459999. On and on and on it goes. Another irrational number but has deep connections with the infinite. And the really cool thing is once we introduce these numbers like pi and e, we find that there's, they pop up in surprising places. For instance, if we go back to pi, one place you maybe wouldn't expect to find pi is when the study of probability. If you drop pins on the floor and you want to know how likely is it to hit a line on the ground, pi shows up there. Or e, e shows up when you start adding up numbers like what is one plus one divided by one plus one divided by one times two plus one divided by one times two times three plus one divided by plus one divided by one times two times two three times four times five and so on and so on forth and so forth. And if you add those all up forever and ever, you end up with e. So introducing these numbers, they're becoming more strange and more mysterious. Perhaps the most mysterious number of them all is I. I's not even real. It's an imaginary number. Perhaps you remember in, in grade school or high school when you first came across I and you're like, an imaginary number, right? This is, this is just, you're playing games with us now. What's going on? Well, if I have a number, I can take its square root. The square root of 25 is 5, because 5 times 5 is 25. But what's the square root of negative 1? It can't be a positive, because a positive times a positive is a negative. It can't be a negative, because a negative times a negative is a positive. So it must be this new kind of creature. We just make it up. We say, let's just call it I. We introduce this imaginary number. Why do we do that? Because when we do, we can start doing really cool things. We start solving algebra problems we couldn't solve before. When we expand our understanding of the numbers from just being the real number line to the imaginary and the real numbers combined, you have a whole new set of possibilities, a whole new dimension opens up. And you get these really cool things like, like fractals, the Mandelbrot set emerges, or, or we can do really fascinating complex analysis, and, and it's stuff that mathematicians consider to be beautiful, so we think we're on the right path. Now, you might be suspect, okay, I was with you with the one and the two and the three, and I was okay with the zero, Pi and E starting to get a little bit strange. What are you doing with this I? But then you see an equation, like E to the I pi plus one equals zero. And all the pieces come, and they fit together. And you know that there was something true about this journey we're on. We're not just playing games. They come together in this beautiful way. What is going on here? How is it that mathematicians, just making up ideas like pi and E and I, are able to have them come together in this beautiful way. This is a problem that the theoretical physicist, Nobel Prize winner Eugene Wigner, thought deeply about. He put it this way. He said, the fact that the great mathematician fully, almost ruthlessly, exploits the domain of permissible reasoning and skirts the impermissible. He says, the fact that this recklessness does not lead him into a morass of contradictions, him making up things like I and these irrational numbers, the fact that it doesn't lead into a bunch of contradictions is a miracle, he says. It's a miracle that we can do this kind of mathematics. 
But then note his comment. Certainly, it is hard to believe that this reasoning power was brought by Darwin's process of natural selection to the perfection which it seems to possess. What is Wigner saying? He's reflecting on the fact that we are able to do mathematics, that we are rational. And he asks, what gives an account for this? Well, if your understanding of the mind is merely that the mind is the end product of a process of natural selection, some unguided process, then why would we trust our minds to be able to reason like this? Why would we expect them to be able to reason this well? After all, natural selection may favor traits such as survivability and the ability to reproduce, but there's nothing in natural selection that favors the ability to reason and to do mathematics. So how is it that we ended up with a mind that's able to do mathematics? Wigner's not the only one who asked this question. Several other mathematicians and physicists have mused about this. Why is it they're capable of doing mathematics? Particularly if we're simply in a, a naturalistic universe, if there's no supernatural element at all, how can we end up with minds that could do this? The actual mathematician, John Lennox, he put it this way. He says, naturalism is fatally flawed. Naturalism, the view that there is no God, was simply the end product of some natural series of reactions. He says it's fatally flawed. Why? Because it undermines the foundations of the very rationality that is needed to construct or understand or believe in any kind of argument whatsoever, including those to defend naturalism. Naturalism gives no account for why we can trust our minds. It undermines itself. He concludes, therefore, it doesn't simply shoot itself in the foot, which is painful. It shoots itself in the brain, which is fatal. Lennox is pointing out that in your worldview, you need to give an account for the mind. And if you're not able to do that, then your worldview defeats itself. A really incredible thing, though, is not just that we can do mathematics, evidencing the fact that we are rational, far more rational than any other animal. It's not just the fact that we can do mathematics, but that mathematics goes on to explain the universe around us. Wigner, again, reflected upon this in his paper, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics and the Natural Sciences, puts it this way, the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. What's he pointing out here? What's his argument? Well, first of all, the very fact that there are laws of nature, that there are some kind of laws of physics, that the universe is ordered, that's surprising in itself. Why would you expect that under naturalism, that there should be some kind of order? But here's the miracle, not only is there some kind of order out there, some deep structure to the universe, but we can understand it. Our minds are capable of making sense of that order. How? Through the language of mathematics. Wigner says the only appropriate word to describe this is miracle. It's a miracle that we, through mathematics, can understand the deep structure of the universe. It's interesting, if you look back at the history of science, why did the first scientists expect to be able to do what they did? Why did Isaac Newton think he could sit down and come up with some unified theory of gravity to not only explain how things on Earth fall, but also how bodies in heaven move? Simple, Isaac Newton was acting out of the conviction that there was a single mind who created both heaven and Earth. And therefore, believing there to be a mind who created heaven and Earth, he expected that mind to follow a simple set of principles in creating both the heavens and the earth. He's not the only one. You look at Kepler or Galileo or these pioneers of modern science. They were driven by the conviction that there is order in the universe because there's a mind behind the universe. More than that, they believe that they, having been made in the image of this God, had the ability to go out and study and learn about that structure through the language of mathematics. Natural sciences were born out of the Christian conviction that the world is ordered because there is a God. Did you know that? That science, the foundation of science, the basic premises of science, this conviction that there was order, that Einstein put it this way, he said, the most remarkable thing about the universe, the most indescribable thing about the universe 
is that it is describable, that we can make sense of it. Why? Well, under naturalism, you would have no, no explanation for this. You have no reason to expect there to be order in the universe. But in the doctrine of creation, we come to expect that because there is a mind behind the universe, and our minds are not simply the products of the universe, we can come to understand that order and appreciate that order. But it gets even richer. The miracle is not just that we can do mathematics, and it's not just that our mathematics describes the order of the universe. There's another level of miraculousness going on, and it's Albert Einstein put it this way. He asks, how is it possible that mathematics, which is a product of human thought entirely independent of experience, fits so excellently the objects of physical reality? What's Einstein getting at here? I, I discovered this when I was a graduate student working on my PhD. You see, my office was in the basement, so I had no windows out into the world. The mathematics I was working on in no way was motivated by reality. The only windows in my office were blackboards. And so the ideas I pursued were not ideas that came from understanding the physical world around me, but they were ideas that I thought were beautiful. Mathematically beautiful. And so we had pursued these mathematically beautiful ideas. This is how mathematics has been progressing. I'll give you an example of it. You learn about geometry in secondary school. You learn about you know, triangles and points and lines. And this is the geometry that dates back to the Greeks. Now, in many ways, that kind of geometry is motivated by the world around you. You have some intuition of how objects exist in the world, how lines work in the world. But mathematicians, you know, they had too much free time on their hands. And so what they decided to do is they said, I wonder if we can change the rules of the game. What if we can tinker with the basic axioms of geometry? There was one in particular that had to do with parallel lines and, and how these parallel lines are, are related to each other. They said, let's tinker with that and make up entirely new rules to the game and see what happens. Now, most people would think, well, why are you doing that? You're making up some rules to a non-existent universe. You're describing something that is in no way grounded to reality. But we're mathematicians, we don't care. It's a fun game. We're in our basement, we want to think about reality. We're on our blackboards, the math is working out. It looks really neat. And so mathematicians in the 1700s and 1800s began developing non-Euclidean geometries. Weird geometries where the rules of the game are very different. What's well, not the kind of geometry you expect. Okay, well, they did this, it was a fun game, let them do their thing, that's fine. But then Einstein comes on the scene in the 20th century, and he's trying to make sense of the universe. He's trying to formulate his general theory of relativity. And it turns out in the process of him formulating this, well, Euclidean geometry doesn't do the trick. And he stumbles upon these non-Euclidean geometries. These, these games mathematicians were just playing and just making up the, 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 the things they were just playing with. But it turns out that those geometries, what he needed, he discovered that, that space is, is curved, there's a space-time, and the curvature of space-time is not best described by the natural Euclidean geometry, but by this weird non-Euclidean geometry that the mathematicians had created. What's going on here? Ideas that the mathematicians had come up with simply because they thought they were beautiful and interesting, those ideas turn out to be the very same things 100 years later that are needed to actually describe the universe. And this is not a standalone story. We talked earlier about I. I is a weird imaginary number, right? Where does that come from? Mathematicians just playing games, making up fake numbers, imaginary numbers. But today, I is essential during physics. We can't make sense of reality without the imaginary number. Time and time again, mathematicians come across and develop mathematics purely because they find it interesting and beautiful, and they're pursuing these ideals of beauty. And, and as they do this, they don't care if it's useful or not. They're just there producing mathematics. But then, a decade, two decades, a hundred years later, someone comes along and they go, that's the math I need to describe the universe. There's some kind of deep connection between the product of the human mind, simply products of our creativity, things that we find to be beautiful with the structure we see in the universe. Is that not a great testimony to the fact that we are made in the image of the creator of the world? 
The fact that what we see as beautiful, God himself sees as beautiful when he created the world. It's a beautiful picture. And so we've seen now these miracles of mathematics, the miracle that we can do mathematics. The second miracle, that mathematics explains the structure of the universe, that there is structure there, but that structure can be explained mathematically. The third miracle, that these mathematicians develop the ideas before they are discovered to be use, useful to describe the universe. They're just, they just pursuing ideals of beauty and they come up with these ideas. But there's a fourth miracle of mathematics I want to end with, one I've become particularly excited about. In the last century, there was a mathematician by the name of Kurt Gardell, and he discovered something called his incompleteness theorem. What Kurt Gardell discovered is that we'll never be done doing mathematics. There's no end to it. Now, some of you may think that's horrifying, <laughs> right? Like, like, it doesn't stop with calculus. You've got to keep going. But Kurt Gardell found this fascinating. Mathematicians get excited about this. This means there's no end to mathematical discovery. We can be forever pursuing ideals of truth and beauty and see how they come together to describe the world around us. As a Christian in particular, this excites me. Because when I, on my blackboard, I'm doing mathematics, my blackboard becomes a window into eternity. It reminds me that these concepts, they're gonna take forever to exhaust. And yet, God has given us the gift of eternity because of what he's done in his son. The book of Ecclesiastes reminds us that God has set eternity in the human heart. Mathematics awakens that, that longing for eternity. Ellen White, in a vision of the world to come, at the end of the book, Education, puts it this way. She says, heaven is a school. Its field of study, the universe. Its teacher, the infinite one. That is what we have been invited into. A recognition that us being made in the image of God are able to study and understand the world and pursue ideals of truth and beauty and come to a deeper and deeper appreciation of God who is the truth and who is the embodiment of beauty. We can pursue that. And that pursuit doesn't have to end, but because of what God has done in Christ, we continue to pursue that for eternity. I'm excited about that. I hope you are too. Maybe I made a mistake becoming a biologist. I'm not so sure anymore. Okay, I think that we, I think that we should have a quiz uh, right now. So uh, let's see here. I, I just uh, I can barely see you with these lights on me, but I, I want to see everybody hold up five fingers. Okay, yeah, you guys are good. You can all count to five. You know what the number five is. Okay. Um, how many of you can hold up pie fingers? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that. I don't know. How many, how many of you can, how many of you can hold up an imaginary finger? <laughs> I can. <laughs> I may be the only person here who can do it. I hope so. <laughs> that finger was really good when I really had it. But as an imaginary thing, it still feels like it's there. It feel, there we go. Oh, man, you know, just when you think you're unique. I walk around Los Angeles and people think I'm making gang signs. But in any case. <laughs> How many of you know what's happening at the end of this session uh, after, after we've had these next two lectures? Question and answer session, right. Now, my understanding is that at some point here, we're going to, okay, um, uh, as soon as, um, oh dear me, where was I? That was an important point I was making too. Okay, so um, I, my understanding is that there are gonna be two ways in which you can turn in questions. Um, on the one hand, you can, um, uh, there's gonna be a number that you can text to. On the other hand, there is going to be a, uh, I believe you can turn in questions also uh, just written on a piece of paper if you don't have a smartphone or something like that. So I want you to be thinking about what kind of questions have been raised up until this point. Um, what sort of, 
what sort of uh, things would you like the people who are going to be on this pa uh, panel to address? Uh, I know that I always come and I find out that there are certain questions that I expect every time, and then there are certain questions that are a complete surprise to me. So I'm hopeful that, um, in fact, uh, you will have some surprising uh, questions uh, for those whom we have on the panel. So our next speaker is uh, um, uh, going to be Major Coleman. I think most of you heard him speak this morning and found that to be a stirring experience. So I'm kind of looking forward to, you know what, I have to admit, I'm kind of jealous because I would love to be talking. This, this is the, the, the topic that he is addressing, the topic of race as it relates to Darwinism is one that fascinates me. And I think that most people who understand what this theory is and care about humanity have a deep interest in the question that he is going to be addressing. So I am going to give him the time and uh, I hope that you enjoy it. Thank you. Please welcome Dr. Cole. Thank you so much. I'm really uh, happy to be back here with you. Um, I'm a little surprised that you're not tired of me yet, um, or tired. I'm a little tired, <laughs> but it's been a very complete day. My specialty is the political economy of race and racism in the United States. My research is based on measuring the cost of racial programs, such as affirmative action, that just, that's just one, but um, politics, welfare, social, cultural, political, and economic cost. But because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and I'm on secular campuses, of course, I have to be very well versed in all aspects of origins, and certainly that means the um, racial asp aspects of, of origin theories, whether it's evolution or creation. Some of you got the handout that I passed out this morning, our origins and basic assumptions, and we have nine basic assumptions. I didn't talk about them this morning. Our first basic assumption is, is, is that science, critical thinking, argument, and good theory are how we learn. Science is where we start. Many Christians find difficulty with that because, well, why don't you start with God? Well, what if somebody doesn't believe in God? Then you can't, what if they don't believe in the Bible? Well, you can't start there. So we start with science and then we end with God. Science is how we learn, basic assumption number one. Basic assumption number two are that origins, what you think about origin is determined by your race or ethnicity. Basic assumption number three, that evolution and creation are mutually exclusive. You can believe in both at the same time. Most people believe in both evolution and creation at the same time, but you can only do one at a time. <laughs> you can only operate in one sphere as a, at a time. Basic assumption number four, that um, where there's a design, there must be a designer. Where there's a super design, there must be a super designer. And where there's a supreme design, there must be a supreme designer. Number five, the earth and the universe are young measured in thousands, not millions or billions of years. Basic assumption number six, evolution violates natural law while it purports to be naturalistic. Basic assumption number seven, God exists. Basic assumption number eight, the Bible is trustworthy and an accurate record of historical events. And basic assumption number nine, a human soul is a unification of mind, body, and spirit. We're not going to go over all of those nine. Today, we're just going to do basic assumption number two. Origins are ethnically and racially defined questions. We have two competing theories of origins, and, and they're not just divided be, between creation and evolution. They're divided by race. We have the, the testimony of the white founders of the evolutionary theory. And number two, we have the testimony of the black liberators. Alfred Russell Wallace. Evolution was founded by three people, not just Charles Darwin. Alfred, excuse me, excuse me, Herbert Spencer, Alfred Russell Wallace, and Charles Darwin. 
our three, the three founders of evolutionary theory. Uh, Nat Turner, Jarena Lee, and Sister Kelly, the black liberators. The European and African theorists all lived at the very same time, and I think that this is amazing, that their lives, the only one we're not sure of it is Sister Kelly. We're not sure when she was born, but if we can just push her back a little bit, they all would have been alive at the same time. These major theorists of origins. Most of the time, we only know the names of the white European theorists. Most people don't know the names of the black liberation fighters, but they are important. Origin theories in African-American culture. Most blacks believe in God as their creator. Blacks speak to God, and God speaks back to them. Black religion is not based on myth or faith. It is based on evidence and experience. Let's look at some of them. Black religion is based on observation and record keeping, but it is not based on controlled analysis. Therefore, black religion is not science, okay? That's important. Let's look at the testimony of some of these black liberators and freedom fighters. Sister Kelly and the need to destroy black origins. Circa 1840, we're not exactly sure when she died. This is what she reported. The whites burned the books with the birth records of the slaves so the slaves would not know how old they were or where they came from. If someone can destroy your origins, they have gone a long way in destroying your personhood. And of course, that was the very object of it. At Christmas time, the, she lived in the South, and of course, the whites would, family would come down from North and they would sell the black slaves off at Christmas. Her story is that she meets God himself by a pond, and God speaks to her and tells her that she never will die a sinner, and she gains strength from that even as a slave. So she believes in God. Why? Because of her experience. Now, I wasn't there with her. I didn't hear it. I can't prove it false or true. Therefore, it's an experience, it's observation, but it's not science. Nat Turner, 1800 to 1831. He was directed by God to destroy white oppressors, 1831 in Southampton, Virginia. God himself, and this is Nat Turner's report, God himself directs Nat to begin the civil war against white terror. Isn't it amazing that, um, let's be frank about this, okay? I'm a university professor and we don't mince words on a, on a secular campus. Nat Turner killed about 50 people and we think of Nat Turner as a terrorist. Had the United States listened to Nat Turner, 30 years after Nat Turner, a million people died in the Civil War, and we think of them as freedom fighters, <laughs> all right? Nat Turner was doing the same thing, stamping out the snake of Southern terror. This direct connection with God establishes Nat Turner, his mission and his personhood. Nat accurately predicted the coming Civil War 30 years away between the North and South. The white church refused to baptize Nat so he, he baptized himself under the spirit of God Almighty. He established his own personhood directly from God because he was rejected by the white church. Jarena Lee, 18, 1783, we're not exactly sure when she died. She's pardoned directly by God. She's sold off from her parents at seven years of age to become a servant girl 60 miles from her birthplace. Can you imagine what that would do to a child? She attempts suicide several times, and she sees Satan as a monstrous dog with his tongue protruding out. She cries out to God to be merciful to me, a sinner, and she is rescued by God. These are, these are, these are tremendous stories of black liberation. Let's look at some origin theories in European American culture. Most whites believe in God, but they accept evolutionary theory in one form or another. In the academy, that is, when I say the academy, I mean in the university, belief in the literal creation story of the Bible disappears for whites. Disappears for whites. In the academy, in the university, once people enter college or university, most whites believe the evolutionary story of human beginnings. They reject creation. 
The evolutionary story is not based on experience, observation, evidence, or record keeping. Thus, just like African American religion, evolution is not science. Here they are, the testimony of the founders of evolutionary theory. <clears throat> Charles Darwin. Um, most races of men are alike except blacks. <laughs> and we'll, so we say, well, why, why would they say that specifically about blacks? You'll understand in a minute. Blacks are happy and they like to dance. Your race determines your humanness. This is scientific racism. Most blacks, blacks are unlike other races. Blacks are more sexual. While blacks vary, they are all savages. Herbert Spencer, blacks have the smallest brains, British have the largest brains. And of course, Herbert Spencer was British. <laughs> blacks in New Guinea are closer to quadrupeds, that is, they tend to walk on all fours while the English walk upright. Whites made up the civilized races. Um, my colleagues get very angry when we point these things out. Alfred Russell Wallace, this is what he, what he wrote, not what he believed, he wrote it. Blacks are less intelligent than whites. He just said it plainly. Blacks are culturally inferior to whites. Some races are more intelligent than others. This is scientific racism, plain and simple. Indigenous people are subject to incredible violence and fits of rage. Let's compare black and white theorists of the 18th and 19th century. Let's, let's take a look at them. All the whites have photos. The blacks have none. We know when the whites lived and when they died, but not for blacks. Only God knows. Whites lived off the labor of black slaves, and they thought that they were inferior. Whites believed humankind evolved with blacks at the bottom of human evolution. These three white men formed the basis for the concepts of social and physical Darwinism which have oppressed blacks and peoples of color for over 100 years. It is no wonder that on my campus, I'm not well liked because I tell my colleagues to their face, Charles Darwin was a racist and a liar. He was a racist because of the things he said about my ancestors. He was a liar because he knew before he died that evolution was true and he refused, was false and he refused to publish it. He knew that it, his theories did not hold by observation. Blacks believed in the personal God of the Bible who created humans and will one day mete out justice against the wicked. Given how the theories began, we should not be surprised that origin theories differ by race. <laughs> they started out differently and they're still, they are still different. Little has changed since the, since the 19th century. Let's take a look. Joseph Graves is a well-known black genetic biologist I have uh, asked Professor Graves to engage in debate. He's refused. Graves explains that blacks are only half as likely to say evolution explains human origins as the general population. Blacks are only half as likely as the general population to believe in evolution. And 40% more likely to believe the biblical account explains human origins. I agree with him exactly. Graves is right on. In addition, blacks are overwhelmingly literalist. They believe the Bible is literal, the creation happened in, in, in six literal days, and they reject theistic evolution at a rate of three to one. We can look here at the differences between blacks and whites. If we look here at this table, we can see that of all whites, the letters in red there, 45% only 45%, now this is whites in general, not, it, it, those that are in college, those that have, have university degrees, those that don't. Overall, 45% of whites believe that evolution is probably true. So even among whites, most whites do not believe that evolution is true, only 45%. But once they go to college and they get a college degree, it jumps to 61%. 61% of white Americans who have a college degree believe that evolution is probably true. University training makes the difference for whites. It changes people's ideas. And this is why the battle is so strong on the university campuses. Let's look at blacks. 
When you look at all blacks, generally, only 28 percent, half the rate for whites, believe that evolution is true. <laughs> Why? Because it's racist. <laughs> all right? And at the university level, blacks with, with four years of education, there's almost no change. It only jumps up to 36 percent. Blacks reject evolution, whether they have an education or whether they do not. OK? Race makes a difference. When we look here at blacks, whites, Latinos, Asians, and uh, uh, um, Indians, Native Americans, we see that blacks are the only racial group in the United States that is predominantly, mostly, biblical literalist. All of the other groups are, are, are split their views between evolution, theistic evolution, and biblical literalism. In this way, I like to say that black is still truly very beautiful. Amen. Let's look at our churches, the churches, the largest churches in the United States. Um, most churches have capitulated to evolutionary theory. I, I'm, I'm on a, I, I think that I'm on a secular campus sometimes. I'm on a campus that is associated with one of the major groups on this list. Yet, they teach, they not only teach evolution in the sciences, in the theological seminary, it is dominated by evolutionary theory, which is a shock to me. Next year, we plan to have our Origins and Basic Assumptions conference on the campus at Emory University. Um, I'm expecting that eyebrows will be raised, so please pray for us, all right? If you look at this list, the ones that I have in red, those are all predominantly black denominations. And you can see not a single major black denomination has accepted evolutionary theory. There are some other denominations, predominantly white denominations, the Southern Baptist, which is the most prominent. But I also have Seventh-day Adventists, the 13th largest church there, um, who, who, who reject evolution. But they're not the only ones. The um, uh, Mormons reject evolution. And the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, also rejects evolutionary theory. But again, they are exceptions to a broad general rule. Britain, Darwin, slavery, and scientific racism, they are connected. Eric Williams, a, a political economist like myself, he found that 14% of all British trade came from the slave trade. 14% of all of their trade. Britain grew rich off of the slave trade. Profits were as high as 100 to 300 percent. Britain, Holland, and France, they fought wars over access to the slave trade because, mainly because of the sale of sugar, the, growth of, the discovery of sugar cane in the New World, and the tremendous need for labor. It was a labor-intensive crop. Um, sugar was like gold. It was like gold. Britain was the main slave transporter. They were not the main enslaver, but Britain owned most of the ships. Slavery made Britain, Charles Darwin, uh, Herbert Spencer, and Alfred Russell Wallace rich. They were all country gentlemen. None of them ever worked for a living. Where do you think that money came from? How, did you, how do you think Britain got all of that money? <laughs> All right. Britain grew rich off of the misery and murder of 15 million people. In 1879, one quarter of the Earth's land surface was in the control of the British Empire, and the phrase, the sun never sets on the British Empire, was actually true. Conclusion. Here, evolution is a theory founded by three white Englishmen writing during the Atlantic slave trade, who benefited financially from black oppression and who invented racist ideas about blacks and built these ideas into their theories and they still exist today. Most whites accept evolutionary theory in one form or another. But evolution's stronghold is among whites in the university. That's where its stronghold exists. Blacks are the only racial group who still hold a strong literalist view of creation theory and who reject evolution. We do not know why blacks support creation and whites do not. But based on the evidence we've seen, we might infer that the black church, Darwin's racism, and evolution's atheism might have something to do with it, but we can't test that empirically. Even the most, this is Charles Darwin writing, even the most distinct races of man, with the exception of certain Negro tribes, are much more like each other in the form 
in form than would at first be supposed. Few people have actually read. My students they, who are studying in evolutionary studies, they don't teach them Darwin's racism, and they're shocked when they, when they hear this. The races also differ in constitution, in acclimation, and in liability to certain diseases. Their mental characteristics are likewise very distinct. Contemporary scientific racism is strongly associated with Charles Darwin and his followers. It did not end in the 19th century. I want to assure you of that. Ernest Houghton, um, Harvard um, anthropologist, specialist in racial classification. He based his work on the work of Charles Darwin, a specialist, and he compared blacks to apes. Um, yet we are fairly safe in assuming that the Australian, he's talking about Aborigines, black Aborigines of Australia, are far less intelligent than is, the, than is the Englishman. And then he had charts like this in his book comparing blacks to apes and showing the similarities between, between the two. Um, uh, Richard Hernstein and Charles Murray, in their in very infamous book, The Bell Curve, they also found, based their theories on Charles Darwin, found that blacks were less intelligent than whites. The late J. Philip Rushton, a Canadian, very strong scientific racist. I actually debated with him in my first year after graduate school at the State University of New York at Buffalo. He said, the hormones that give blacks an edge at sport make them restless in school and prone to crime. AIDS in Africa is caused by the larger sex organs and lower intelligence of blacks. That's evolutionary theory. Black origin theories are generally rejected, that is, a literal creation is generally rejected at the university level. Darwin and his racism are not even discussed on campus unless you find someone who, like myself who's bold enough and doesn't give a hoot about evolutionary scholars, all right, who's going to come forward. My job is to provide the scientific support for the origin theories held mainly by blacks and based on a literal reading of the Bible, that is what I do. Which origin theory you hold is strongly related to your race and your ethnicity. I want to say this again. We are in the time of the end. We're not looking forward to it. We are in the time of the end now. This is the time that is crucial for our young people. Many people, and I'm afraid that many Seventh-day Adventists will lose their souls because they play games with evolutionary theory. Evolution is not a joke. It is very serious. The scientific bigotry in the academy is very strong. And I want to encourage each of you to educate yourselves about the science so that you're not taken unawares. Thank you very much. Sometimes I've had people come to me and say, why are you wasting your time and talent? Why do you care about creation and evolution? That's not going to save anybody's life. That's not going to help anyone. You should be working to, I don't know, uh, cure cancer or something like that. But in reality, when you start looking at these numbers, I, how many of you were shocked to, 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 to just, just to see those statistics and to think about the number of people who have been affected just in this country by this religion that we call Darwinism. Um, it's, it's sobering, and it should be sobering for all Christians, because the biblical view is so consistent and so opposite from what Darwinism leads us to think and 
do. I'm going to have to kill just a little bit of time here because Ryan Hayes is down with the, with the children. Um, I don't know whether um, somebody could pop down and, and tell him, hey, we're ready. We're ready and waiting. But oh, he's here. He has appeared like magic. It's like magic. Yeah. See, that wasn't evolution. That was creation almost, wasn't it? Fabulous. Well, anyway, you know, these are things that we as Christians, not, not as black, not as white, not as Asian, as Christians, Jew and Gentile alike, slave and free alike, as Paul would have put it, we need to contemplate this and think about how we can work in our societies to change this way of thinking. Darwinism has to be racist. It cannot be anything else. There are people who argue against that, but they, they simply do not understand the theory that they are arguing for. You see, in Christianity, all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, as the Declaration of Independence put it. In Darwinism, everything, not just humans, humans are no different from the weeds that grow out in your yard, or the rats that you exterminate in your basement, or, the, or any other creature. We are no different at all. And that means that some of us must be more fit and some of us must be less fit. There is no such thing as equality in a Darwinian view of things. So I won't, I won't continue with that sermon because it can go for a long time. Please, yes, please yes, welcome Dr. Ryan Hayes. He uh, teaches chemistry here at Andrews University. All right, good afternoon. It's good to be here. Right now, as we speak, there is 120, 130 kids going through and learning about the chemistry of creation. And that's a little bit of what I want to talk to you today. There's so much to do and so much to talk about when it comes to understanding how God form this world and we can see certain patterns of his hand at work and that's why I want to share one thing with you today and this is uh, called the water trap. You see uh, we take a lot of things for granted that planets should have water because when we watch movies you know they, they go uh, astronauts and space travelers they end up on planets and they have water on there and I think we're going to find that that is rather um, maybe unlikely to find water on the surface. There's quite a feat, a quite a chemical challenge to put water on the surface. So I have a lot of talks that I like to help people understand how God designed this world uh, through the eyes of a chemist, because of course that's what I am. And it's so important to learn about water. Water is amazing. And as I teach about the properties of molecules in my class, I keep referencing uh, water because we're mainly used to that. We experience water, we swim in it, it's pretty safe other than the drownings and the floodings that happen. So in that regards, it's one of the most dangerous chemicals in the world. But uh, the water molecule is so amazing from its chemical properties, we get trained uh, from our daily experience to, to think that water is very normal. And it's not. It is so amazing. And scientists know this, and they know that you need to have water to have life. It's so amazing. And so at least over the, the last five or six years and in my class, I think about what are the amazing properties of water? I've come up with 14. I'm not going to talk about all of them right now. Just going to discuss a few. And our kids downstairs are learning about some of the properties of water as well as they go through the seven days of creation. So what are some of the properties of water? What makes it so amazing? One of them is its density. You guys experience that, at least here in Michigan. We see that when water freezes, what happens to the solid phase of water? We call ice. What does it do? It floats. It expands and it floats. That is one of the most unusual properties of chemicals. But most people don't know that. They just think that's usual. But that's 
chemistry unusual. There's certain other aspects of water, it's polarity, viscosity, it's melting point, it's boiling point. These are all things that are very unusual and are not expected, but we see it in water. How it holds on to heat and how it, it has a lot of surface tension and, and uh, uh, leaves and bugs and pollen, these things can all float on water because of its tension, surface tension we call it. It's a, a good global warming gas, and I know that seems to be a bad thing, but we don't want to have a cold planet either, so water plays a big role into that. And I can go on and on about some of the other properties that are there, but it turns out when we look across the board at a lot of chemicals, and I try to do this, there is nothing like water. It should not, when we make predictions about properties, it should not be a liquid. It should not be a liquid at the temperature and pressures that we see it here on our planet. It should be maybe a gas, like it's uh, other chemical cousins, I would call it. That is another talk for another time, but we need to know how does a planet hang on to its water. You see, there are three major ways for a planet to lose its water, and I'm learning about these. I don't consider myself an astrobiologist, but I do know a thing or two about chemistry, and NASA and other scientists um, have been uncovering different ways that planets can lose their water, and it's pretty amazing that Earth can hang on to its own. So what are some of the ways? I'm gonna go through three ways, there's probably more, but three major ways that a planet can lose its water. One has to do with the solar wind, and we'll, we'll talk about this, uh, an electric field, what's that all about? And photolysis, another good college word that we'll easily explain here in a few slides. So we try to, uh, some people try to downplay the fact that water is not that, uh, not that great of a chemical, but it has so many amazing properties, and to have it on the surface of the Earth is truly an amazing chemical feat. So let's talk about uh, the first uh, thing right there. So we have the little uh, uh, planetary bodies talking to each other on the slide. And uh, there are moons that have water on the inside of them, and they're probably frozen solid. So how do you get liquid water, and how do you keep it? One of the important things about our planet is that it has a really strong magnetic field. And that itself is an amazing design. We're a rocky planet here on Earth, and inside, deep down inside, is this hot uh, molten core that's made out of iron, and it's slowly turning. That slow turn of the metal in the middle of our planet creates a magnetic field. That really strong magnetic field extends out beyond the planet and does something very important. It turns out that this magnetic field, at least the strong of one, is pretty rare, especially for our planet and our, and our solar system. What does it do for us? Well, if we didn't have this mag magnetic field, we would be bombarded and our Earth would be bombarded with the solar wind. The sun is producing a lot of light, we enjoy that part of it, but it's also producing a lot of particles. So you can imagine it like a machine gun in some ways, shooting a lot of particles towards all the planets in the solar system. These particles that are coming from the sun, they're ions, they're very reactive, and they can hit the atmospheres of the planets and start ripping the molecules out. And that is a bad thing because if you have something important in your atmosphere, oxygen or nitrogen or water, it can start to rip those things out of the atmosphere and they will leave the planet. But we have a magnetic field and that blocks it for us. So that is amazing that we have that because that's not a given on any planet. So there's other debilitating things that can happen if we got hit, not only would it uh, get rid of the, the air and our atmosphere, but if we were hit by the solar wind, it would definitely damage our DNA and would lead to mutations and cancer. And we experience some of these things uh, that go along with electric grid uh, disruptions. Uh, this happens when there's solar flares, so some of this makes it through, uh, but only on intense magnetic or intense uh, solar flares that happen. So we're very, we should be very thankful we have a magnetic field. We, not every planet has that. Recently, and unrelated to the magnetic field, as it turns out, some planets have an electric field. There's some great videos on YouTube on all this, and I encourage you to go watch uh, these things. NASA recently uh, was detecting an electric field, totally different from the magnetic field. In physics, we often think magnetic fields and electric fields are connected with each other. I think this is somewhat disconnected. So there's no necessarily uh, correlation between a uh, magnetic field and electric field. Well, Earth has a really weak electric field. And a lot of times when we think of properties like, oh, we have a weak magnetic or electric field, 
Shame on Earth. Why is that? That's, you should have something strong and mighty like the magnetic field. Well, there's problems with having a strong magnetic field. When NASA scientists went to study the electric field on Venus, they found it to be about five to 10 times stronger than the electric field that's on Earth. Well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, if you have a really strong electric field, like Venus, it can do some really bad things to water and the air. But for water, that electric field is strong enough to split it, water, into its components, oxygen and hydrogen. And that electric field is strong enough to, to send oxygen kicking out into space. Well, if you lose your oxygen and hydrogen, there goes your water. And scientists at uh, NASA believe this is probably how uh, Venus lost its water, was through its strong electric field. Wow, this becomes another design property that one must think about if you're going to design a planet and you want it to hold on to its water. You can't have a strong electric field. Oh, and Earth doesn't have one. We have a relatively weak one. That's pretty amazing right there. So you can't have uh, a strong electric field, but you need a large magnetic field. And Earth has it in the right proportions. That is an amazing story right there. But it turns out there is another way that you can split water into its components, hydrogen and oxygen, and maybe lose the hydrogen part because hydrogen is very light. One way to do that is through UV light. We get quite a bit of UV light from our sun. And it's enough that it could split water. So it's called the photolytic, because photo meaning light, splitting, uh, water splitting, okay? Using UV light. Now it has to be pretty strong and of a, of a certain type of UV light, and it will split it into hydrogen and oxygen. Now many of you know if you had a helium balloon and you let it go, where would it go? Out in outer, well, it'd go up in, in, you know, up in the air and eventually the balloon would pop. And what happens to the helium? It keeps going and it leaves our planet. Earth's gravity is not strong enough to hold onto hydrogen or helium. They're basically the same thing when it comes to floating away. And we're kind of glad that Earth is not big enough to hold onto hydrogen because if it did, we would have hydrogen in our atmosphere. And we're running some experiments downstairs. I don't know if you've heard them, but if you have hydrogen and oxygen mixed together, you get a little bit of a reaction that may occur, especially if you give it a spark. It's a bomb, by the way. Oh, so we're running little bombs down there with the kids right now. We're keeping them kind of small. So if you have UV light coming from your star and hitting the planets, boy, that could split the water too. And that makes it through, and enough of it, uh, makes it could make it through our atmosphere. How is the Earth designed to protect against photolytic water splitting? Well, we do use this kind of a thing, by the way, as a, as a nice technology to, uh, germ uh, to get rid of bacteria and stuff in water. You can shine UV light. So you'll see it as germicides, and it won't do too much to our water, except for maybe split it into hydrogen and oxygen. But how does our Earth protect us against this UV light that could split water and send the components away? Well, as I was talking about, if you had something like a hydrogen or a helium balloon, they have a really low density. And when those gases are in our atmosphere with nitrogen and oxygen, boy, those things just float away. Now, there are some really heavy gases that we're also playing with with the kids. Man, there's so much we can do with chemistry. You have heavy gases like argon, carbon dioxide, and ozone. You may have heard of ozone. We're going to talk about that. These gases are really heavy and want to sink down to the bottom of the surface. Well, you may, uh, so we're going to start talking about ozone because that is part of the water trap. But if we had these light gases like hydrogen and helium, and if they were split off from water, they would leave. And if you lose part of water, like the hydrogen part, you don't have any more water. Well, you may have some oxygen, which would be nice, but no water, no life. So there is a great design between our air, the size of the earth, the magnetic field, in the electric field, whew, there's so much more to think about in terms of chemistry. And we're going to go and explore some more things here. Let's think about the layers of our atmosphere as we go away from the Earth towards outer space. Scientists have divided them into different layers. Uh, there's the troposphere, uh, what do we got, the stratosphere and the thermosphere. 
and uh, I think there's an ionosphere in the different parts. Now, we often experience as you go up in, the, in, in altitude, it, what happens to the temperature? It gets colder. Did you know it doesn't have to be that way? In fact, right above the, uh, the troposphere that we live in is the stratosphere, and it actually gets warmer as you go up. Okay, and then it gets colder in the next layer, and then it gets warmer in the, in the outer layers, and then it gets really cold in the, in the confines of outer space. And so there is this heat and cold aspect. Well, it turns out as we go high enough in the troposphere, which is the layer right next to Earth, it gets so cold it can freeze essentially all the water out. And so there is this coldness that traps the water. And so it gets cold enough, and that then turns water into a solid, which then will sink down and help it from getting too far out. Well, that's very nice that we have the right temperature in the right places to freeze water out. But the story is more elaborate than that because we need to. Because anywhere in there, if, uh, oxygen, or if UV light got on and hit water, it would split it into oxygen and hydrogen, and the hydrogen part would leave. So we still have to worry about the UV light. Now, the cold is really helping to trap that out. So the next time you, you think about going up into a plane or climbing a mountain and it's really cold up there, we have to be thankful for that cold because that is what's helping to trap some of the water. But as you go up, there is another layer right above the uh, troposphere, and that's where the ozone is. Now, that's pretty amazing. I don't know if you heard when I was just talking about the density of ozone. It's very dense. How is the ozone layer way up high up there protecting us? I think we've heard maybe many times that the ozone layer protects us, and I'll show you. But how is it up there? It's a very dense gas. It should be down here at the bottom with us. How does this heavy gas stay up there as a layer? That intrigued me, so I had to think about this. We need to get to know ozone a little bit better. And how does it get there? Because this is a chemical conundrum. Dense gas at the top. God likes to put dense things at the top sometime. You should go look at the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> the gold is at the top. That is, that is like one of the most dense materials. And then it goes in, in uh, less dense, less dense materials as it goes down. You shouldn't put the dense thing at the top. That's bad design. Or is it? And when God's in charge, he knows what he's doing. And let me tell you what we've learned chemically what's going on there. So what is ozone? Ozone is an oxygen that we breathe with an extra oxygen in there. Well, where did that extra oxygen come from? Some people think, ozone, it's got three oxygen in there. We should breathe that. You will be super oxygenated with this super oxygen molecule. Hang on a minute. We uh, maybe should learn about its properties. I don't know, how many people have encountered ozone? Maybe you just raise your hands. I can almost see your hands. Yeah, I see a few hands out there. I actually got to work for a company where we were utilizing ozone for a number of projects. So I got to learn about it. It's really cool and dangerous at the same time. Now, some people who live in uh, cities, large cities, they have ozone alerts. Has anybody been in a city where there's been ozone alerts? A few? Does that mean you go outside and, and run and breathe the ozone? <laughs> no way. It's an alert because it's a danger. Well, what's going on? Well, ozone is an extremely reactive compound. That extra oxygen with the two other oxygen atoms that our gas that we breathe has, oh, it doesn't like that confirmation, so it will go and react with other things. I have a little demonstration right here that I'd like to show you uh, that its dangerous uh, abilities that it has. I have an ozone machine. Ah, oh, you can buy these on the internet. This wasn't too bad, I think 60 or $70. I don't know if I should be promoting A to Z ozone, but uh, I don't even know who they are, but they produce a nice little ozone machine. And all they do is take electricity and, and pass it through our air, and it generates ozone. And it's a gas, and you're gonna see bubbles coming out of here. And everything I do seems to make bubbles somehow. Maybe the Dr. Bubbles turn means something. All right, so I'm gonna turn this on. And I'm going to put it into one of these solutions right here. 
These solutions that I have, they're just blue food coloring, and it seems to work best with the blue one. This should be going, ah, here we go. And I'm just gonna drop the ozone into one of these. I just took some blue. Ah, there we go. There's the bubbles. Those bubbles are gas molecules of ozone. And I hope you can see what's gonna go on. It's gonna take a few minutes. Not everything that chemists do happens in an instant. You have to let them marinate and cook and uh, develop a little bit. The blue sample on, my, on, my, on the right-hand side here is my control. We should always run a control so we can see what happens. And we're gonna let this ozone mix in there, and I'm gonna tell you some of the properties of it, and you can see it right here. Now, you might be able to read on my slides that ozone is good at killing germs. It's actually a very destructive molecule. You should kind of think of it like bleach. Would you go around and breathe bleach? No. So there are some air purifiers that purify the air by putting some electricity or even UV light through the air, and it produces ozone. It has a distinctive smell, and some of you might be able to smell it here in a little bit. Usually I have my kids out here running around so you guys can smell it, but uh, considering our time constraints, we're just going to watch its properties here. Now the bad thing for us is that, well, if you were to drink bleach or breathe bleach, it would start to destroy you, the mucus lining, make you more susceptible to getting sick, and that's not good. So breathing ozone, probably not the best thing. Taking a few whiffs is okay, but if we sat there and breathed it thinking, oh, it's super oxygenated air, I'm gonna get healthy from that. Unfortunately, the opposite will happen. So we have our ozone doing its thing here. I don't know if you can see it yet. I can a little bit. It might help to have a little white background. Can you guys see anything yet? A little bit. Oh, we'll give it time. The blue food coloring is what we call an organic molecule. That's a chemist term for molecules that are made out of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen sometimes. And organic molecules, you're made out of them, and all of life is made out of them. That blue food coloring, it does not stand up to ozone at all. And eventually, as you might be seeing there, it helps when I swirl it, uh, the blue is starting to fade. It's being destroyed and going away, never to return, actually. And so ozone is a very reactive, a very destructive and dangerous gas. That's why having it at our level is not good, and it's a huge danger. Well, how does it get up there, and how is it not coming down here? It has to do with all of these properties right here. So we're going to keep swirling. Can you guys see the color going away? Yeah. And eventually it will all go away. And it depends on how much blue you put in there. And I think I got a little rich on the blue. All right. So ozone, how is it created up there? Well, you can use electricity to create ozone, passing through oxygen, or you can use UV light. Our sun is producing UV light. And as, it, as the UV light from the sun hits the oxygenated atmosphere, it breaks apart some of the oxygen, uh, O2, which is our air that we breathe, and some of those go and react with another O2, and they make O3, ozone. That is happening way up high. That ozone is very dense, and so it starts to come down. Do, 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 do. <gasps> But thankfully, it's so reactive, it bounces to other gas molecules and is destroyed before it comes down. So it is trapped up there at the right spot. Well, how do I know it's the right spot? Well, let's talk about that. Because if that ozone layer was anywhere else, it would have a problem. Actually, I think if it was higher up, it'd probably be okay. But if it was any lower, we would have a problem. It would be dangerous to us and it would be very dangerous to water. Now you can see in this picture that ozone is really good at blocking UVC light, which is very dangerous, some UVB, some of it gets through, and it blocks some UVA. Now I've gotta show you this. This is what makes me super excited, and this might put you to sleep and cross your eyes. This is a graph that shows which light, based on the nanometers on the x-axis, that's the horizontal axis, it shows which light oxygen absorbs in the UV, and it shows which wavelengths ozone works. 
And I love this because oxygen is protecting us from UV and x-rays and gamma, so is nitrogen. And as oxygen, oxygen is destroyed, it creates this ozone, this ozone. Oh, that's, that's swirling. Oh, that blue's almost gone. As the oxygen is destroyed, it creates ozone, which has some different properties and adds additional benefit in blocking some of the UVC and some of the UV light. That's what that graph shows. I love that graph. So I, I, chemists don't just make things and, and uh, mix them. We actually study how light goes through them. At least I do. It's called spectroscopy, and that's great. So ozone and oxygen work together to protect us. It's like our planetary uh, suntan lotion. It gives us the sunburn protection that we need. And that layer, as it turns out, could be anywhere, depending on the amount of oxygen and the amount of uh, UV light coming from, uh, from the sun, that ozone layer is right above the troposphere. If it was lower, then we would have a problem. Then the oxygen or the water would get too high up and experience life outside of the ozone layer, or out, if it was too high up, it would split. So in my picture, I'm trying to show you here, this is very important. That cold trap that's around the earth does not affect oxygen, does not affect nitrogen, hydrogen, or helium. Those gases just go right on through, which is very important because oxygen then needs to go up high enough, be hit by the UV light from the sun, split, form ozone up high, and create that additional protection that we need at the right spot. You see, if water was able to go above the ozone layer, well, water could be split then and then leave. You have gotta put the layer of ozone in the right spot or it won't trap uh, water in the right way. So we have our trapped water because of the cold. We have additional protection because of the ozone layer. The ozone layer stays up there because it's a reactive gas and it reacts before it hits to the bottom. This is the water trap, and this amazes scientists, especially me. Oh, this is so exciting. And how, how did this get all designed? An oxygenated atmosphere actually produces ozone. That's a natural consequence as long as your star nearby is producing UV light. You may have seen outside some clouds that look like this mushroom shape, because as the water in the clouds goes up too high, it hits this almost like a ceiling that's up there, the cold and the ozone layer, it's mainly the cold that is stopping that. And then ozone provides the sun uh, burn protection up there. Amazing. So let's review all of these things that work. How is it? So water freezes out in the troposphere and it just so happens to be cold enough and in the right place so we can freeze water out. Oxygen stays a gas and goes through that cold trap. And when oxygen's up there, it gets bombarded with just the right amount of UV light to make ozone. That ozone layer is in the right place to protect water so it doesn't split into oxygen and hydrogen, and the hydrogen for sure would leave our planet. So all of these things work together to create a trap for water. Oh, and let's not forget about the correct magnetic field and the lack of an electric field that also keeps our water trapped on this planet. That, I think, is amazing. So all of these things one must think about when we're creating a planet. Whew. And we're starting to learn these things. So God's hand is now starting to be revealed, I think, in the design of our planet. The more we learn about science, the more we learn about how he does things. I can go into a ton of detail for each component in our air and show how it is finely tuned for life. And perhaps those will be talks for another time. You see, when we look at a bunch of gears like this, we don't go, well, you know, if you throw a bunch of these gears in a box and you slam them together with some heat over time, it'll create a system like this. Yet, yeah, that's what we, a lot of people think about, if you take a planet and you put it right, you know, some gases in there and you shake it next to a sun, you get life. No way. There are so many systems that have to come together chemically, and we know this because we're, we, we go in the kitchen and we make things. We know if we get the ingredients wrong, the thing that we're trying to make doesn't work out. And when I see our world and all the components that are being made, this is just some of them, by the way, the light, the UV lights, the oxygen, the ozone, magnetic field, I see a system that is finely tuned all working together. The chances of that happening are very low. 
So the probability of a planet that has a water trap starts to become lower and lower. Now, is it impossible? No, not necessarily. But there are so many other factors that we need to think about. These are just a few of them that a chemist starts to think about. I didn't even get into all of them. And so when I think about God and what he's, de- what he's done, I think about some important verses uh, in Job. Job chapter 12, it reads, But now ask the beast, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you, or speak to the earth. Oh, that's what we've been doing today. And the earth will teach you. Thank you for teaching us. And the fish of the sea will explain it to you. Who among these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? You see, it takes an intelligence and a hand to enact a lot of the things that we see in this world. In whose hand is life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Oh, Job is hitting it here, telling what the Lord has done. We see God's intelligent hand working in these things. So I'm not sure how much time I have left. (laughs) We got a couple more minutes. Okay, so I will just wrap up and say that when I start to look at these things, and I thought other scientists had looked at this before. I'm thinking, and they do. There are some scientists out there who are thinking about the design of our earth. And I can tell you the story gets more amazing as we start to look at where did the oxygen come from? That's a great mystery. There was an article uh, a, a few months ago, the top 10 mysteries of our planet. What was one of them? Where did the oxygen come from? We haven't solved this little mystery. How did we get all of our water? That's a mystery too. These are the simple molecules. Now, I think if you can't explain where a protein came from, that would be, that's a real mystery. I'm talking about water, H2O, oxygen, O2. There's two oxygen atoms. How come we're not able to figure this out? This because the explanation that there was an intelligence that helped to create these is not, is not part of the academia, that we can't include that an intelligence came and formed these things at, the, at, at a certain time. And the mystery, I don't think, or the chemistry is telling us that there are certain things that can happen and certain things that cannot. So for me, when I look at it as a chemist, because I actually go in and try to make things, and I see how challenging it is to get molecules in the right order in the right place. And to think that this stuff just happens by chance is not what I see in the laboratory and not what a lot of chemists see in the laboratory. So I think uh, there's a lot more to explore And I think we need to see how the design works. And there's a lot more things that we can teach our kids about how it works. And that's what we're able to do with our creation science program that we're doing with the kids. And that I was able to do a little bit here with you today. So I thank you for your attention. And let's learn a little bit more about our world and ozone and water and all these amazing things that God has created for you to have life and to have it more abundantly. Thank you very much. Keep that ozone machine away from me.